السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله زاد المستقنع في اختصار المقنع continuing with our journey through the chapter of Salah we come to where the author may Allah have mercy upon him Imam Al-Hajjawi he says today ثم يركع مكبرا after the person has recited his surah al-fatiha and his surah then the person will go into ruku' whilst making takbir so this is known as takbirat al-intiqal the takbir of moving from rukun to rukun okay so that teaches us that if it's takbirat al-intiqal from moving from rukun to rukun then it shouldn't be said at the rukun that you are leaving right nor should it be said at the rukun that you are trying to reach so from ruk- from standing position it it shouldn't start at the standing position it's as soon as you move from the standing position all the way until you get to the ruku but it shouldn't be said in the standing position or in the ruku so it's intiqal it's between those two positions okay that's the best scenario of doing it if you happen to say it in the part of it in the ruqan that you are leaving and part of it in the ruqan that you are going to it's okay it doesn't invalidate your salah inshallah but it's something that you should try hard to avoid as the ulama they say okay so you making this takbirat al-intiqal from the standing position after reciting going into the ruku whilst making takbir of course what do you do before you make this takbirat al-intiqal so you finish the recitation and you make the takbir. What do you do before the takbir al intiqal? Before you say Allahu Akbar, what is there? There's three of them, remember? No. We mentioned last week that there's three sakatat. There's three places where you have a sakta, sukut. You remain silent. One is after the takbir al ihram. One is after surah al fatiha, before reciting a surah. And this is the third of them. After finishing the surah, before you go into the ruku, there's a small, very short, insignificant type of pause, okay? So this is done before you go into the uh, ruku. The author, he says, Rafi'an yadayhi. The person raises his hands as he goes into the ruku, okay? So saying Allahu Akbar, you raise your hands and then you go into the ruku. Why? Because in Bukhari and Muslim, the famous hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, where he said, Ra'aytu an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam iftataha takbir fi salah, farafa'a yadayhi, hina yukabbiru, okay, wa yaj'alahuma hadwa man kibayhi. I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he made the takbir in the salah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibn Umar is saying that he would raise his hands and he would make them to the position of his man kibayhi, position of his shoulders. Okay. وَإِذَا كَبَّرَ لِرَقُوءٍ فَعْلَ مِثْلَهُ And if he went for the ruku, he would do likewise, meaning raise his hands to the shoulders. وَإِذَا قَالَ سَمِيَ اللَّهُ الْمَنْحَمِدَ And when he said سَمِيَ اللَّهُ الْمَنْحَمِدَ فَعْلَ مِثْلَهُ He would do likewise. ثُمَّ قَالْ رَبَّنَا وَلَكِ الْحَمْدِ And then he would say رَبَّنَا وَلَكِ الْحَمْدِ وَلَا يَفْعَلُوا ذَلِكَ فِي السُّجُودِ وَلَا حِينَ يَرْفَعَ رَأْسَهُ مِنَ السُّجُودِ But he would not raise his hands when he would go into sujood, nor when he's raising his head from the sujood. Okay? So here in this hadith, in Bukhari Muslim of Ibn Umar, the raf al yadain is made at the takbirat al-hiram. Then it's made when you go into the ruku. And again, it's made when you say, Sami Allah liman hamida, getting up from the ruku. Okay? So this is the famous position of the madhab. And we said it's not to be done in sujood, right? But, or going into the sujood, or getting up from the sujood. But there is a narration in Bukhari uh, that mentions Ibn Umar did so, and Ibn Taymiyyah, he holds that opinion that you can do it. Tayyip? In any case, what we've taken so far, the Imam, he says, you make the takbir, you go into the ruku, and you raise your hands. And then he says, وَيَدَعْهُمَا عَلَىٰ رُكْبَتَيْهِ مُفَرَّجَتَيْ الْأَصَابِعَ And then his hands, he puts them on his knees, okay? With his fingers spread out. Because in the hadith of Sahih al-Jami' of, of Shaykh al-Albani, of Wa'il ibn Hujr, who said, كَانَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا رَقَعَ فَرَّجَ أَصَابِعَهُ وَإِذَا سَجَدَ ضَمَّ أَصَابِعَهُ Wa'il ibn Hujr in the hadith found in the collection of Sahih al-Jami' of Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, said that when the Prophet ﷺ would go into the ruku', he would place his hands 
he would spread his uh, fingers open like so, meaning placing his hands on the knees, but with his fingers spread open. And when he would go into sujood, he would place his hands with his fingers together. So when you go into the ruku, like the imam is saying, you spread your fingers, okay, on the, on the knees. However you hold the knees. You're spreading your fingers, but you're making qabd of the rukbah. You are holding the knee, okay? Then the author, he says, mustawiyan dahrahu. And the back of the person should be straight. Now, with regards to the ruku, there are sifatan. There are two things that you have to bear in mind. Sifatul mudzi'ah, that which suffices, okay? And the sifatul mudzi'ah, that which suffices, is that the person... If he's of normal stature, meaning he hasn't got those orangutan arms, the very long arms, right? Normal arms, his hands should be able to touch his knees. That is the one that suffices from the ruku. Okay? So his back doesn't have to be straight. Maybe he's got a problem in his back. Okay? But as long as his hands can touch his knees, that is the ruku that suffices. Okay? Sifatul mudzi'ah. And sifatul kamila, wahil mustahabba, the one which is recommended, highly recommended, is what the author said. Mustawiyan dahrahu That the person's back would be straight Okay And this is found in Ibn Majah Of Wasib ibn Ma'bad He said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ra'aytu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Yusalli fa'idha kana raka'a Sawa dahrahu Hatta law subba alayhi al ma' Lastaqar Wasib ibn Ma'bad in Ibn Majah He said I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pray And when he would make ruku' He would straighten out his back to the extent That if you were to put water on his back the water will remain still. It wouldn't run down from the excessiveness of the straightness of the Prophet Sallallahu back. So this is what is highly recommended in the ruku. Okay? A sifatul kamila. But the sifatul mudzi'ah, the one that suffices, is that the person's hands, non orangutan hands, should just touch the, the, the knees. Okay? The person should be able to touch his knees. With regards to the head, the person shouldn't be dropping his head, nor should he be raising his head. It should be in line as naturally as possible with the back, which has been made straight, okay? And the elbows of the person who's making the ruku should be stuck out. Unless... Unless what? Unless there's people there. If you're praying in jama'ah, you shouldn't be harming the people with this sunnah. But if you're praying by yourself, or if you have space, then you should be putting your... Uh, elbows outwards, okay? So the person does what so far? He says the takbir from rukun to rukun, meaning from standing to the position of the ruku, raising his hands, okay? Raise your hands as you make the takbir. And then when you place your hands on your knees, you're holding your knees, but your fingers are open and your back is as straight as possible, with your head not going up nor is it going down. Subhana Rabbi al Azim. And then the person he says, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. Al-Azim, as we know, has the meaning of magnificent and great and powerful and all these meanings pertaining to that, okay, pertaining to Al-Uzma. Subhan, whenever you say Subhan, Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhan Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhan means Tanzihullah min kulli naqs, that you are removing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any possible attribution of deficiency, okay, fi amuri thalatha, in three things. So you are removing from Allah sifat al naqs You are removing from Allah Azawajal that Allah, people attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that which is deficient. So anything like having a son, for example, that is deficient and it is not acceptable to be attributed to Allah Azawajal. That is part of the meaning of saying subhanallah or subhan rabbi al azim Another of them is a naqs fi sifat al kamal Allah Azawajal, his characteristics which are affirmed for him, like Al-Khaliq, that Allah is the creator. When Allah creates, there's nothing which is negative pertaining to that. So Allah doesn't get tired after creating. So when we say SubhanAllah, we are removing from Allah, naqs fi safat al-kamal. Any of Allah's attributes which are affirmed for him, like I give the example of creation, we don't attribute then in those attributes any form of deficiency. Like yes, Allah creates, but he gets tired, no. So any deficiency from Allah is removed in that also. And also, mumathilatil makhluqeen. That there is no comparison between Allah's attributes and that of the creation. Allah's attributes are far distinct and beyond that of the creation. So we say that Allah has a hand, the creation has a hand. 
but be, between them there's no resemblance whatsoever. Laysa kimithlihi shay, wa huwa sami'ul basir, right? There's nothing like unto Allah. So when you say Subhan, it's tanzih Allah and kulli naqs. You are removing from Allah any shortcomings or of any type, okay? And these three things. The wajib to say Subhan Rabbi al Adim is once, okay? You have to say it once. وَأَدْنَ الْكَمَالِ is thalatha. And the least of the best is to say three times, okay? Once is obligatory and to say it three times is what you should try to do. And if you are praying by yourself, you can go on and on as much as you want to do. However, bear in mind that in the Salah, the Prophet ﷺ, he used to have each part of the Salah similar to the other. So if you prolong in the Ruku or the standing or the Sujood, you should then prolong in the other areas as much as possible. Okay, this is something which is mentioned about the Prophet ﷺ's salah. So, once is obligatory, three is better, adn al-kamal. And if you're by yourself, you say as much as you want. With regards to the Imam who's leading a congregation, then the most he's allowed to say according to the madhab is ten. The most he can say is ten times. Okay, unless he agrees with the congregation that they want more than that. If they agree they want more than that, 10 times, then you can go ahead and say more than 10. But the most that the Imam can say is 10 tasbihat. ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُ رَأْسَهُ وَيَدَيْهِ And when the person now is coming out from the ruku, he raises his head, of course, and he raises his hands. قَائِلًا إِمَامٌ وَالْمُنْفَرِدْ That the Imam will say in this position of raising and the Munfarid. Who is the Munfarid? We've mentioned this word a few times. Huh? I can't hear you. The one who's praying alone is the Munfarid, right? So the Imam and the Munfarid, as they are coming up, they will say, Sami Allahu liman hamidahu. Okay? Allah is the one who praises him. Allah is the one who praises him, but the meaning of this is Allah yustajabu liman hamidahu. Allah answers the one who praises him. So the literal meaning is that Allah hears the one who praises him. Sami Allah man hamida. But the meaning intended is Allah yustajabu liman hamidahu. Allah, what did I say? Answers the one who is praising him. But how can Allah, why is Allah answering here? There's no dua taking place. So Shaykh Taymin rahimahullah ta'ala and others, they mention that this is dua bilisan al-hal. This is dua, what they say bilisan al-hal, by the virtue, or you could say it's dua al-ibadah. It's Dua Al-Ibadah, which is that through the act of worship, you are expecting the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So through praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are respecting reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you're doing the praise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that reward. So this is what it means that Allah answers your dua. Allah will give you the reward of the one who is praising Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبَعْدَ قِيَامِهِمَا رَبَّنَا وَلَكَ الْحَمْدِ So the Imam and the Munfarid after getting up, they say what? Rabbana walak alhamd. This Rabbana walak alhamd, it comes in four ways. Okay? You can say Rabbana walak alhamd, or you can take the wow away and just say Rabbana lak alhamd. So you have two now, right? Rabbana walak alhamd, Rabbana lak alhamd. Now you add to this Allahumma. Allahumma Rabbana walak alhamd. That gives you three. And this one without the wow, Allahumma Rabbana lak alhamd. Okay, so these are the four ways which have been narrated authentically from the Prophet ﷺ. And then after having said that, the Imam or the Munfarid, the Imam or the one who's praying alone, after he says, Rabbana wa lakil hamd, he can say the rest of this dua, Milla sama'i wa milla al-ard wa milla ma shi'ta min shay'in ba'd. To the extent, I am praising Allah, Allah's hamd, to the extent of what is in the heavens and what is in the earth and what is between them. You're praising Allah to that extent, okay? This is one of the understandings of this. Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala, he gives another beautiful understanding. He says, huwa anna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mahmudun ala kulli makhluq yakhluquhu. That Allah azza wa jal is praised for every creation that he has created. Wa ala kulli fa'lin yaf'aluhu. And every act that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Wa ma'lumun anna samawat wal ard bima fiha kulluha min khalqillah. And it's known that anything between the heavens and the earth is full of what? It's full of Allah's creation and full of Allah's actions, right? So all of this is praise. Allah is praised for all of these. Praise for everything that He creates and for everything that He does from the commands, 
from the giving, from the withholding, from the moving. Okay? So everything in the heavens and the earth is praised, Allah is praised due to it. So you really need to think about that when you're in that position. Okay? When you said, Sami Allahu liman hamidahu, min al samai wa min al ard wa min la mashitta min shayin ba'd. It's a beautiful dua. Try to learn it and think about its meaning. That I am praising Allah in this position for everything that He has created in the heavens and the earth and everything that is taking place from His actions, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ma'mumun fi raf'ihi. Now the ma'mum, he says different. He doesn't say like the Imam and the Munfarid. The ma'mum, he says, Rabbana wa lakil hamd faqat. All he says is, Rabbana wa lakil hamd. He doesn't go beyond that according to the madhab, okay? And saying this, Rabbana wa lakil hamd, as a ma'mum, it has a huge reward. In Bukhari al Muslim, in the hadith, it said, Ida qala al Imamu, Sami Allah al Manhamida, if the Imam says, Sami Allah al Manhamida, faqulu, Rabbana wa lakil hamd. Then you say, Rabbana wa lakil hamd. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ وَافَقَ قَوْلُهُ قَوْلُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ غُفِرَ لَهُمَ تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ For very the one who says that, and his saying matches with the saying of the angels, then all of his previous sins are forgiven. Okay? So from you, after the Imam, he says, سَمِّيَ اللَّهُ الْمَنْحَمِدَ You say, رَبَّنَا وَلَكَ الْحَمْدُ And if you say it and it matches that saying of the angels, then your sins are forgiven. So you see that the reward is huge. Now, the author Al-Hajjawi and the opinion of the Madhab, as we mentioned, is just to say, Rabbana wa lakil hamd, and not to extend beyond that, right? Like the Imam could extend, and the Munfarid could extend. Ibn Taymiyyah from the Hanbali scholars, he said, no, you can do as the Imam, okay, and the Munfarid. So Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion in the Madhab is that the Ma'mum, he can do as the other two. But the author, Hajjawi, he says, no. He says, stick to Rabbana wa lakil hamd. Tayyib, where do you put the hands after the ruku? So you've come up from the ruku. Where were your hands before the ruku when you were standing in the salah? They were standing wherever you put them, right? On your chest, below your navel, above your navel. So the opinion, which is mashhur, the famous opinion, the madhab, is that you have the choice. You have the choice to put them beside, beside you while you're waiting to go into sujood. Or in that standing position, you can put them back where they were uh, whilst you were standing in the salah. Okay? Okay. So after he's completed his standing and he's saying his du'as, he's done his du'as, then he goes falling down into sujood by making the takbir, okay? He falls into sujood, making takbir. Sajidan ala sab'ati a'da. He makes prostration sujood upon seven limbs. How many limbs? Seven limbs, right? Rijlayhi, his feet. Thumma rukbatayhi, then his knees. Thumma yadayhi, then his hands. ثُمَّ جَبْهَتِهِ مَعَ أَنْفِهِ Then his forehead with his nose. Okay, and this is based in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim of Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه where the Prophet ﷺ said أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أَسْجُدَ عَلَى سَبْعَةِ أَعْظُمْ Okay, I've been commanded to prostrate upon seven limbs. عَلَى الْجَبْهَتِ وَأَشَارَ بِيَدِهِ عَلَى أَنْفِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم Upon the forehead and then the Prophet ﷺ pointed to his nose saying that the, the, the forehead and the nose are considered as one limb in prostration. Okay. وَالْيَدَيْنْ And the two hands وَالْرُقْبَتَيْنْ The two knees وَأَطْرَافِ الْقَدَمَيْنِ And the, the feet, okay? وَلَا نَكْفِتُ أَثْيَابْ وَشَعْرْ And not to tie up, and not to roll up any uh, clothing in the salah or for the salah and nor any hair. Do not tie up your hair in the salah. So this hadith is proving what the author is saying. That you have to prostrate upon seven limbs, okay? You have to press straight upon seven limbs. What did you notice about what the author said? He says, Sajidan ala sab'ati a'da. Prostrate upon seven limbs, rijlayhi, starting from the feet, thumma rukbatayhi, then going to the knees, right? So the author is not holding which opinion? Regarding sujood, what is the author not holding as an opinion what many people do hold? Yeah, so this is also... Uh, a lot of people, they hold the opinion that you go down with your hands first, right? So the author's opinion here and the majority, the humbly opinion and the majority of ulama, they say to go down with the knees first, not with the hands first, okay? Now there's a lot of discussion and a lot of proofs on either side of the discussion. Both sides have many strong proofs. Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah in his Majmul Fatawa, he said it's known amongst the ulama, the fuqaha, that both are acceptable. There's no debate to say one is acceptable and the other is not. 
it's of, it's the discussion is of Daliya, what is better? Okay? What is better? And the humble scholars, they said it's better to go down with what? With your knees first. So Shaykh al-Islam said, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ بِاتِفَاقُ الْعُلَّمَاءَ أَنَّ صَلَاءَ بِكِلَيْهِمَا جَائِزَةً That both ways, according to the fuqaha, is permissible. The author, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says, وَلَوْ مَعَ الْحَائِلْ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَعْضَاءِ سُجُودِهِ Now the person, when he makes sujood, he's allowed to make sujood upon a covering of some sort, which is not from the body parts that he has to make sujood upon. So the seven body parts are not allowed to be prostrated on. So I cannot take my hand and prostrate on my hand, right? However, anything else you are allowed to prostrate on. So this is broken into three things, this statement. So the Imam is saying, the author is saying that you can make prostration uh, upon a ha'il, upon a covering of some sort. And yakun al-ha'il min a'da'i sujood, this is not allowed. If it's from one of the limbs of the sujood, like we said, the hand or the forearm or something of that sort, then you are not allowed to do a prostration upon that. And يَكُونُ الْحَائِلْ مِنْ غَيْرِ أَعْضَاءِ سُجُودِ لَكِنَّهُ مُتَصِلْ بِالْمُصَلِّي Or the ha'il, or the thing that you are prostrating on, is not from your limbs of sujood, but it's connected to you, like it's a piece of your clothing, or you're wearing a gutra or something, and it's too hot on the ground, so you want to put your gutra on the ground, a part of it, whilst it's still on your head, and prostrate on that. Or you have a long sleeve, for example, you can pull the sleeve and prostrate on it. So it's connected to your body, this is allowed. However, the ulama, they say that if you do this, avoid specifying just the forehead. Avoid specifying just the forehead with this ha'il. Why? Why do you think? Did you understand what I'm saying first? So like, if you were to get a piece of your clothing, because the ground is too hot and you want to prostrate on it, you're allowed to do so, but don't do it in the sense that you just get something which just fits your forehead. Because this is resembling the rawafida from the extreme Shia. Okay, because this is something they do in their faith. That they only prostrate upon something, a piece of paper or some type of stone or something of that nature, which is fitting on the forehead. So to avoid that is something which should be avoided. And the third of these things, and يكون الحائل منفصلا عن المصلي Of course, if the hail, if the thing that you're prostrating on is distinct from you, is not part of your clothing, is not part of your gutra, is like a little mat or something, then of course you are allowed to prostrate upon that. So the author basically, he said in summary, that when you do this prostration, your prostration is valid also if you prostrate on something which is not connected to the limbs that you are using in prostration. Okay, so he's saying to you that in the salah, if it's difficult for you, you can get something and put it to pray on that. وَيُجَافِ عَدُدَيْهِ and جَنْبَيْهِ So when he is in the position of sujood, the man, he doesn't keep his limbs, his arms close to him. يُجَافِ and جَنْبَيْهِ He moves them away from his sides, okay, his arms. وَبَطْنَهُ and فَخِدَيْهِ And his stomach, he moves it away from being crouched against his knees, uh, 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 crouched against his thighs. So he's not crouched up like a ball. وَيُفَرِّقُ رُكْبَتَيْهِ And he keeps his knees apart. Okay? So in a very natural position, Bukhari Muslim, in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Buhayna, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا كَانَ صَلَّى فَرَّجَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ حَتَّى يَبْدُوَ بَيَادُ إِبْطَيْهِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in this hadith of Bukhari Muslim, is reported that when he would make the sujood, when he would pray, in the sujood position, he will have his arms away from each other to the extent that the whiteness of his armpits could be seen, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? So a lot of, he would move his hands away from his body in the sujood position. But remaining natural. Because in the hadith in Bukhari Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu said, as narrated by Anas, اَعْدِلُونَ فِي السُجُودِ وَلَا يَبْسُجُوا أَحْدُكُمْ دِرَائِهِ إِنْ بِسَطُ الْكَلْمِ That be be and natural in your sujood, don't overburden yourself and do not extend your arms like a dog does when it sits down. Okay, when the dog lays down, it puts its full arm out, not just on its hand. So the Prophet is saying, make your back not fully extended and also don't be leaning on your forearms like many people make that mistake in the salah. Okay, the Prophet said not to do that, you should lift up your forearms uh, from the floor. So we said that the stomach is not crouched against the thighs, you're not crouched up in a tight ball, okay? And the knees are to be separated, okay? 
Why didn't the author mention where to put the hands in the position of sujood? But why did he not mention it here? Mentioned it before. Allah I said he mentioned it before when he was giving the description of Takbir al Ihram, if you remember. When the Takbir al Ihram, he said, put to your shoulders like you do in the sujood. That's why he didn't mention it again here. And the feet, as mentioned in Sahih ibn Khuzayma, the feet should be together. Okay? The feet, they should be together. If one is praying upon behind the man who is making long sujood, right? Making long sujood. So you find yourself tied in the position of sujood. You're not allowed, as we said, to rest upon your forearms. Then what can you do to help yourself? You can take your elbows, okay? And you can put them on your thighs as a way, as a position of helping yourself in the sujood. Okay, this is, the sujood is long. And what if you are doing that, praying by yourself? You shouldn't be doing it. Because once you get to a position of being tied in the salah, you should move from that position. Because the whole point of the salah is khushur, to have tranquility and concentration. So you shouldn't put yourself in your salah when you get tired, okay? So then the author, he says, then in the position of the sujood, the musalli, he has to say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. Okay? Uqba ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, as narrated by Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah and other places. He said, Lama nazalat qadr wa ta'ala, fasabbih bismi rabbika al-Azim, glorify and praise your Lord the Azim. The Prophet sallallahu said, Ij'aluha fi rabbuikum. Put this in your rabbuikum. That's why we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. Okay? And when the verse was revealed, the Prophet said, put it in your sujood, and that's why we say, Subhana Rabbi Al A'la. So, what does it mean to say Subhana Rabbi Al A'la? Like we said, Subhan and Subhana Rabbi Al A'la, the same meaning that you're removing from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala any form of naqs, any form of deficiency that can be imagined is removed from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. And when you are in this sujood, you have to remember as a Sahih Muslim, that is the best position that you can be in. The best position, the closest that you are ever going to be to Allah, the hadith says, is when you are in the sujood, so increase in dua. Don't be from the road, so bounce up and down. Very quick in the sujood. Why? You're losing out on so much. This is a position that Allah is watching with you. Allah is answering your du'as. It's like some of them, they said that this position is more comfortable than the embrace of your mother. You know your mother, when you had a hard day, when things are difficult for you, she'll embrace you and take care of you. This is more beneficial for you and more comfortable for you for, than that. I asked Shaykh Hazim Hafidullah, he said it's like, when I go down to kiss my mother's feet, he said this is no other fault. There's nothing more than beautiful than kissing your mother's feet. He said it's not a point of enjoyment, but he said yet the position of sujood is far beyond that in terms of enjoyment. So that's what we need to try to bring to ourselves, to our souls. That when we're in sujood, we're communicating with Allah, we're close to Allah, He's answering our du'as, and it's the blessed place that we can be. Then the person from the sujood, he raises his hand, making the takbir. Raises his head, making the takbir. And then he sits in the position between the two sajdas with his right foot up and his left laid out. Okay? As we normally do. Can somebody show it? Mm-hmm. Show the ones. This. Okay, look. This. Your nasib and yumna, your iftirash and your sunnah. Okay? Because Aisha, radiallahu anha, she said that the Prophet sallallahu said, she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana yafishu rijabu. Yusraf al salah wa yansibu rijla bin yumna. This is in the sitting position between the two sisters. You have a question about this? Why is it in this position? You mentioned you're going to keep your arms up when you're in a. In the jama'ah, you don't do so. Like in the room. In the jama'ah, you don't do so. Like in the room. Tayyib. So he sits muftarish. Okay? Between the two sisters. Wa yakul, Rabbi al fil. And the person says, Oh Allah, forgive me. Rabbi al fil. Okay? This is something which has to be said between the two sajdas. There's other narrations of this. Rabbi khfili walhamdu wa'adani. 
was Wundi wa Fahdu wa Zakni, etc., etc. You can find other narrations of this statement which you should learn and you should say. Okay? So between the two sisters, you are begging Allah Azawajal for what? For forgiveness. Not big fully, I will not forgive you. Wa yasjudu athariya kaboola. Then you make the sajood of the second one, the second sajda, like you did the first one, the same one. Second sajda, the first, like the first one. Thumma yalfa'u mukabbira. Then the person gets up making the takbir. Nahidan ala suduri qadamayhi. Resting or getting up uh, using his feet. Okay? On the soles of his feet. So what does this remove as an opinion that some people hold? Using your hands. Exactly. Using your hands and making the sifa of the hajim. Okay? So according to the majority, especially the humble scholars, that this sifa of getting up using your hands, you don't do so. Okay? And also, the author, he didn't mention here another thing which some people do after they get up from the sujood, after they make such a thing, they get up. Um, what do they do before they get up? Raise their hands. No. Not the, we mentioned the raising of the hands already the issue. We said that maintaining the right Ta'ala said it's uh, allowable to do that. The, the author's opinion is no. He would take said it's allowed because of the hadith of Ibn Umar al Bukhari. That in that position, raising from the sujood, he would raise his hands, the Prophet. Okay? So before getting up, uh, to stand up after the sajda thing, some people they have just simple istirah. They they have a rest, they have a pause. Okay, they sit before they get up. Okay? The majority of the ulama they say this is not legislative. The Prophet did this due to old age, due to the need of having to rest. Okay? So this is the opinion of the mother that you don't do this, it's not legislative. And one of the Imams of the Madhab in Qudama, Rahimu Ta'ala Maqtasi, he said that you can do it if there's a need. Like we said, if you're old and age and you need to rest there, just at the you can do it. Uthaymin Rahimu Ta'ala makes a very important, uh, interesting point in his explanation of Zadul Mustaqlish, Shabul Mumta. He says, look, every position in the Salah has a dhikr, a qawl, every position. True? There's no position in the Salah except that you're saying something. Except for just at the there's nothing you're saying which shows that it's not intended to be an act of worship. Okay? It's there if there's somebody had to do it. Okay? If somebody had to do it, you go ahead and do it. But it's not there intended as being a part of the act of worship. So anyway, we said, we said the person gets up after making the two sujood, saying Allahu Akbar, getting up without using his hands, if he's able to do so, if he needs to use his hands, he can do so, and if he needs to make that uh, the sitting of pause, he can do so. مُعْتَمِدًا عَلَى رُقْبَتَيْهِ إِنْ سَهَلًا مُعْتَمِدًا عَلَى رُقْبَتَيْهِ إِنْ سَهَلًا Not using the hands that what we're saying, only uh, from the knees straight up. Okay? وَيُسَلِّ أَثَانَ كَذَلِكَ مَا عَالَ التَّحْبِيمَ وَالْسْتِفْتَاءَ وَالْتَعَوُّذَ وَالْتَجْدِيدُ الْمِيَّةَ Then the person will pray the second rakah like he prayed the first rakah. Except that he won't make dua al-istiftah, he won't make the open dua, nor will he make the, uh, before that, the tahrimah, the takbir, the, uh, the first takbir, he won't make that. He won't make the dua list if that. Nor will he make the ta'awwuf. Nor will he seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nor will he make a new intention. The same intention at the beginning of the salah will suffice the whole of the salah as long as it remains there. So all that is saying, pray the second rakah like you pray the first rakah with the exception of these four things. However, Shaykh Uthaymi Rahimahullah Ta'ala said, if the person didn't make the ta'awwuf in the first rakah, he can make it in the second rakah. So if you didn't seek refuge from Allah in the first rakah, you could do it in the second rakah. What is the surah of the, this masala? How do we conceptualize this? Say a person came to the masjid and he caught the imam in the rakah of the first rakah. So he missed the position of being able to make a ta'awwuf, of being able to seek refuge in Allah, okay, from shaitan. So when does he do it? He does it then when he gets up for the second rakah. Okay? As mentioned in Brother Nubi, I also by Shaykh Uthaymin. Thumma yajisru muftari shan. After a person has prayed two rakah and he's going to go to at the shahud, he sits muftari shan, like the brother showed us before. Right? The right leg is up, the right foot is up, and the left foot, the left leg is spread underneath him. Right? وَيَدَاهُ عَلَى فَخِذَيْهِ and his hands are going to be placed on his thighs. So in the position of the shahud, 
you place your hands on your thighs as we all normally do. يَقْبِدُ الْخِنْصَ الْيُمْنَا وَبِنْصَرَحَ Okay? The khinsa and the binsa, you bring them together like so. Okay? The khinsa and the binsa, bring them together. وَيُحَلِّقُ إِبْحَابَهُمَا مَعَ الْوُسْطَى And the ibhab with the wusta, you make it into a circle. Okay? وَيُشِيرُ بِسَبَابَتِهَا فِي تَشَهُدِهِ وَيَبْسْطُ الْيُسْرَى And this one, the sababa, okay, you point with it. You point with it, or if you have the opinion of moving, you can move it, right? In the tashahud. So exactly like I'm doing, these two fingers are brought together, the other two you make a circle with, and this one, the sababa, you point with it, okay? Some of the narrations, they say you grab all of your fingers and you point like that. Some of the narrations, they say you point and you move your finger and you point at times. Whichever of them you believe to be authentic and correct is well and good. But in any case, the Imam is saying that the shahud, you point, why do you point in the shahud? What are you signifying? Tawheed of Allah is one, that your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, okay? So you signify Tawheed of Allah as the Lord. ويقول, and then you say in that position that uh, to the end of what the author is saying here. Okay, Attahiyatu Lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibatu wa salamu alayka ayyuha al-Nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu wa salamu alayka wa ala ibadillahi salihin. Okay, this is what you will say. And then, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. In the first, Tashahud. Okay, this is taken from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Rasul radiyallahu anhu. Who said in Bukhari Muslim, Kunna idha kunna ma'an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi salat, Kunna as-salamu ala Allah min ibadihi wa as-salamu ala fulam wa fulam. That Ibn Masood radiyallahu anhu said, We used to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the prayer, and we would say, say, As-salam upon Allah, salam to Allah, from your slaves. And salam upon such and such a person. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La taqulu as-salam ala Allah, fa inna Allah hu salam. Don't say salam upon Allah, for verily, Allah is jalla, he is salam. One of his names is that he is salam, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا يَقُولُ But rather say, and then he told them how to say this tashahud, التَّحْيَاتُ بِاللَّهِ The one that we just mentioned, okay? So what does this mean? This is very important. التَّحْيَاتُ لِلَّهِ التَّحْيَاتُ جَمْ تَحِيَّةُ وَالتَّحِيَّةُ هِيَ تَعْضِيمُ So when you say التَّحْيَاتُ لِلَّهِ You are saying that all types of magnification of Allah Azawajal and glorification they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know the heart of the human being. It's our disposition that we run after the creation. We try to get famous from the creation. We try to get close to people who are famous and royalty. Right? Because we always think we're going to get benefit from them. So part of your tawheed is that this, you keep it in your heart as much as you can for Allah azza wa jalla alone. This that theme that you walk around with, you don't give it to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, you respect other than Allah azza wa jalla. You give them their rightful position. But this, oh my God, that is such and such a person. Wow, you know, I've got his autograph. This kind of behavior doesn't exist for the believer. Because his heart is so full of magnification of Allah. This is why it means here. But the hayyatu lillah. Your ta'adhim is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was salawat. The next word, was salawat. Was salawat here means what? So the tahiyya is for Allah and the salawat. What's the salawat? The five daily prayers and also any dua which is made. Okay, because dua linguistically means salah. So any salawat that we do, whether it's the prayers or the dua, it's for Allah Azza wa Jal alone. وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُمْ مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدٍ قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتُ وَمُسَكِ وَمَحْيَاهَا وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And other such teachings. Everything we do from the salah and the dua is for Allah Azza wa Jal alone to please Him. وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ طَيِّبَاتِ هِيَ means all forms of goodness in terms of good deeds, etc., they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So you have to fight your soul regularly to ensure that whatever good deed you are doing is for the pleasure of Allah alone. You don't care if the creation sees you or doesn't see you. What you care is that Allah is seeing you. As long as Allah is seeing you do the good deed, nothing else matters. That is what you are trying to bring to your mind. Assalamu alayka ayyuha nabi. As-salam, as we know in the time of the Prophet when he was alive, is that you ask Allah to give the Prophet security and protection and peace and tranquility. That is the meaning of salam. But after the passing of the Prophet what does it mean? As-salam, peace, tranquility. What does it mean? Protection. So the Prophet has passed away now. He's in the Barzakh. 
So what does it mean for us to say As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi? It means we are asking Allah that the sharia that the Prophet brought is protected from corruption and deviation. And also that the Prophet himself is protected from any harm that would be there in the grave or in the day of judgment. Okay, so this is the meaning, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. So we said that the Prophet is alive in the present, he's not with us in the dunya. But this kaf, this kaf that we say, is the mir al mukhata It's the pronoun which is useful when you speak to someone. I say to Kaifa Hal Ka, this ka, Assalamu alayhi ka. Yeah? But is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in front of me? Why am I saying? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in his grave sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah in his grave, but cut off from the world, right? The only connection he has to the world is that which the angels bring to him. In terms of they bring to him the salah that we said. This is the connection that he has, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the world. So why do we still say ka? Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahu ta'ala in his book, Iqtida Suwaq al-Mustaqeem, he said this is because quwwata is the ihtidara li Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's as though when you are giving salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because you are so much concentrating on that, it's as though the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in front of you. That's what the righteous people do. Salihin, this is how they give their salam. Not us, we just give words, right? When they say, As-salamu alayka, ayyuhal nabi, it's as though they imagine that they are saying it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why you still use the word, you still use the dhameer, the pronoun, kaf, and Allah knows best. Wa rahmatullah, and Allah's mercy upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And here, al-murad bi rahmat, huna al-fawz bin matlub, wa du'ala hu bi salama, ay al-naja ila al-mahmud. Here, the meaning of rahmat is not just to have mercy, it's rather that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is has achieved you make dua to Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet has achieved the reward for what he intended to do which which was to establish Tawheed in the Ummah okay so that is what you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for al rahmah that the Prophet is rewarded okay and that he is protected from any harm wa barakat barakat is the plural of barakat Right? Which has the meaning of growth. And nama wa siyadah. So you ask in the life of the Prophet sallallahu if you were there, that the Prophet sallallahu life be full of barakah. But now that the Prophet sallallahu has passed on, what do we mean by this word barakah? It means growth. So we mean that the sharia of the Prophet sallallahu that the followers of the Prophet sallallahu okay, they are growing in number. And the sharia of the Prophet sallallahu grows in strength. Why? Because every good deed that is done, who gets the reward of it? The Prophet So that's why we want this barakah in the Sharia of the Prophet that people become Muslim in droves. So the more they become Muslim, the more the Prophet is given from this in terms of reward. Assalamu alayna. When we say Assalamu alayna, we are giving salam to ourselves, peace to ourselves, peace to the angels, and peace to all of those who pray with us. Right? Assalamu alayna. We ask for peace. Beautiful thing to ask for. Why that And upon the righteous slaves. A righteous person is the one who gives the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rights of the people. So any righteous person who is out there, you are making dua for them. Going back to the hadith of Abdullah bin Masudin, which was teaching us this tashahud, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, If you say, This dua, which is any righteous person that is alive okay in the heavens on the earth so you're making dua for all the righteous people and this also teaches you that you should learn to love the righteous people when you see somebody doing good it should give you so much joy that this is the person who is joining me in my journey to Allah Azawajal. this is the person that has the same concerns that I have which is to establish the tawheed of Allah Azawajal in life you know if somebody supports my football team how happy I get right man he's a little bit support right <laughs> We get happy. But this should be more so when we find that somebody is righteous in the pond of here. We should have more love for them and more support for them in that situation. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. When you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, shahadatu ala al khabr al qati' bi anna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is alone. You are giving a you are giving a witness, a testimony based upon knowledge and belief that none has the right to be worshipped. Allah Azza has the right to be worshipped except Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So when you say Ashhadu Allah and 
you know nothing about Tawheed, you're not really saying this. You have to know about Tawheed. What are the rights of Allah Azawajal? What are his rights? Okay? What is deserving to him from his creation? وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And when you say this, أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ طَعَقُهُ فِي مَا أَمَّ وَتَسْتِيقُهُ فِي مَا أَخْبَرُ It means to obey the Prophet Sallallahu in everything that he commanded. وَتَسْتِيقُهُ فِي مَا أَخْبَرُ And to believe in anything that he came with. Any news that he gave you, whether it's a command or it's a news about the Akhirah, the Unseen, you believe in that. وَإِجْتِنَابَ مَا لَهَا عَلْمُ وَزَجَرُ and to stay away from any prohibition that he commanded you to stay away from. And not to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except by that which he legislated. So all of this comes under Ashhadu, I testify and I bear witness that Muhammad is the slave of the Prophet, is a slave of Allah and his messenger. So when we say Abdu, his slave, what is one of the benefits of saying that the Prophet is a slave? It saves us from doing what many extreme people do, that they try to make dua to the Prophet You don't make dua to the one who is a slave, you make dua to the one who is the owner of the slave, right? The Prophet was given this high position of being a slave. Slave in Islam is a very high position. It means you are full of servitude to Allah You have been chosen by Allah to worship Him. And when Allah calls the Prophet in the Quran, He addresses him as a slave. So we should never take the Prophet ﷺ beyond that position. He doesn't share any attributes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is distinct from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet he ﷺ is the best and most perfect of the creation of Allah subhanahu So remind ourselves that he is the abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says in the tashahud, then the person says in the tashahud, what we've said so far, is the first tashahud, right? What we said so far is the first tashahud. Now the author is going to speak about the second tashahud. So what we said so far is the first tashahud. ثم يقول الله صلى الله محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. الله مبارك على محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. Okay, this is what the author is saying, which is authentic to. Mentioned in the Tashahud. There are other narrations of how to say this, but this is the one that the author feels is the most authentic and it's based upon the narration of Ka'b in the original Bukhari Muslim where he said, Khawja alayna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came out to us, فَقُلْنَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ قَدْ أَرَفْنَا أَوْ قَدْ عَلِمْنَا كَيْفَ نُسَلِّمْ عَلَيْكَ فَكَيْفَ نُسَلِّيَ عَلَيْكَ They said, Ya Rasulullah, we've known how to give salam to you, but how do we make salah for you? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught him this. He said, Kulu, and then he mentioned this same narration which the author has mentioned, right? Allahumma, when you say Allahumma, what does it mean? Allah. Huh? Allah. It means Ya Allah. So the meme, the meme has taken the place of Ya, Ya Da, the meme has taken the place of that. So saying Allahumma means Ya Allah, okay? Allahumma, salli. What does salli mean? You are asking Allah to make salah for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what does salli mean? Salli. It's the type of dua Imam Bukhari collected from Imam Abu Ali from the Imam of the Tabi'in who said it means that the Salah of the Prophet that it means to praise and extol the virtues of the Prophet in the highest of gatherings, in the gatherings of the heavens. Okay? In front of that creation in the heavens to extol the virtues of Muhammad. So when you say Salli ala Muhammad, you are begging Allah to extol the virtues. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amongst the creation in the heavens. Wa ala al Muhammad and also upon al Muhammad, the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his followers. Okay? Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim, like you make salah upon Ibrahim. The like here, kama, is not kafir uh, tashbih. It's not like in the sense that the quality the quantity that you did for Ibrahim why? Because Muhammad sallallahu is higher than Ibrahim al-Islam. So it's here, the kaf means ta'aleel. It means like you did for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi then also do like for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi But we're not meaning like in terms of quantity and quality. Okay? Because Muhammad sallallahu is higher. Wa qawluhu al Ibrahim, the al of Ibrahim al-Islam, Ismail, Ismail, Ishaq, and his, and their children. 
Okay, so make a salat on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family and his followers like you did upon the family of Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam. Inna ka Hamid. Inna ka Hamid. Verily you the one who is oft praised. Hamid is from Fa'il. And it wasn't Fa'il. The one who is praised oft and repetitively. So Allah Subhanahu is praised time after time and place after place. Inna ka Hamidun Majid. So what does Majid mean? Majid means majestic and all powerful, the one who has authority and uthma, okay, has complete power and complete authority and kibriya and sultan, these meanings. And then at the end of the tashahud, after having said the salah al ibrahimiyyah what does the person do? The author says, وَيُسْتَعَيْدْ مِنْ عَذَابِ جَهَنَّمْ Did the person seek refuge from Allah from the punishment of the hellfire, وَأَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ And from the punishment of the grave, وَفِتْنَةِ الْمَحْيَةِ وَالْمَمَاتِ And from the trials and tribulations of life and death. Life is full of tests and tribulations and so is death. So we seek refuge from Allah in these things, from these things. وَفِتْنَةِ الْمَسِيحَ الدَّجَالِ And the trials and tribulations that will come with the Masih al-Dajjal. The Dajjal, the evil life that will come at the end of time. And this is taken from the Hadith of Bukhari Muslim of the Prophet said, Once you have made your tashahud, the Prophet said in Bukhari Muslim, they seek refuge with Allah from four things. And he mentioned these things. Say, اللهم إني أعوذ بك من عذاب جهنم ومن عذاب القبر ومن فتنة المحيا والممات ومن شر فتنة المسيح الدجال ويدعو بما ورد and then you make dua after saying this dua make dua so what does this tell us about tashahud tashahud is an amazing position for making dua going back to the hadith of عبد الله بن مسعود where he was teaching the tashahud the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said at the end of it ثم يخير من الدعاء then choose from the du'as that which is most loved to you and go ahead and make du'a. So here the author is saying that you should make du'a from that which has been revealed, I mean that which is revealed in the sunnah. Use those du'as in the tashahud to increase in betterment for yourself, your family and your loved ones. But it's not restricted, other ulama say, to only that which comes in the sunnah. You can say any du'a that you wish. As long as it's legitimate for you to make the dua of those words and those meanings. Okay? ثُمَّ يُسَلِّمْ عَنْ يَمِينِهِ أَسَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَأَنْ يُسَلِّمْ كَذَلِكُمْ Then he makes salam, salam upon the mean, upon the right, salam alaykum. And then here also, on the left, salam alaykum. With regards to وَبَرَكَاتُهُ He said, salam alaykum wa اللَّهِ بَرَكَاتُهُ شَيْخْ خَالِدُ وَشَيْقًا He said that this expert is shared. It's, it's dubious in its uh, authenticity to say uh, this okay if it was the third rak'ah or a fourth rak'ah the author is saying obviously you get up after making the first tashahud what we just finished now is the second tashahud right he said if it's the third rak'ah or a fourth rak'ah you would get up after the first tashahud okay and then you will pray the other rakah, the third rakah, or the two rakahs which are left if it's a four rakah prayer, like you prayed the first two rakahs, except that you wouldn't read a surah. So what he's saying here that you read surah al-Fatiha, and that's it. Okay, if you have a third rakah or a fourth rakah. ثُمَّ يَجِسُوا فِي تَشَهُدِ الْأَخِيرِ مُتَّوَرِّكَ and then when you write the last tashahud, okay, the one that you recite that we just took, you recite the salah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and you make refuge in Allah Azzawajal from these four things in the last tashahud, you said tawarruq. The sifa of tawarruq is that you have your right foot up and your left leg goes underneath you, coming out from your right leg. Does anyone know how to do it? Can you do it? To show the brothers? That's the one. Like that, okay? So you, you're putting your um, the left underneath you and coming out. This is Tawarra. So this is only in the last Tashahud when there is a second Tashahud. It's only in the last Tashahud. If it's like in a two rakah prayer, you wouldn't do it. You only do it in the second Tashahud. 
And also there's different ways of doing it. The way the brother showed us, where the foot comes from underneath you. And there's another way of doing it, which is you can put it between the, the thigh, between the calf and, and the, the thigh, the, the hands. So where his foot is now underneath, it wouldn't be underneath, it would be above his calf. Okay? Between the calf and the, uh, the hamstring. That's another way of doing it. So this is Tawabuk. And then the author, he says to finish with what we're taking today, The woman is the same as the man. And he said, The Prophet said that women are the same as men. Okay? Except here that the author, he said, لَكِنْ تَدُمُّ نَفْسَهَا But a woman, she doesn't extend her body in the situation. She brings herself close. Nor does she extend her back. She tries to compact her body as much as she can. وَتُسْتِلُوا رِجْلَيْهَا فِي جَانِمِ يَمِنِّهَا And she puts her legs in the, uh, in the tashahud towards the right of her. Exactly what that means, I don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But the point here that the author is saying, that the woman in all of the actions of the salah are like the man, except in the exceptions which are mentioned. And one of the exceptions he mentioned here is that the woman, she should spread herself out because of the awla, etc. Sita, it's better for her to conceal herself and to bring herself closer together. Of course, there's another opinion uh, amongst the scholars who say that the woman is exactly the same as the man because there's no clear evidence, according to them, to, to prove the separation. But in any case, our author, our Imam, Allah have mercy upon him, he said that in this situation, that the woman, she differs from the man, that she shouldn't spread herself out like the man does, nor should she sit in the manner that the man does in the last of the shakhr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Anything which was correct from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shortcomings and mistakes from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions, then feel free. If somebody can check the phone to know if there's any assistance questions.